Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll visit Icelandic State Park. But first, joining me now is guest author Rolf Sletten, author of Medora, Boom, Bust, and Resurrection. Well, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, John. As we get started, tell the folks uh, a little bit about yourself, your background, where you're originally from. Well, I'm uh, from North Dakota, lived here all my life. I grew up in a little town called Surus up by the Canadian border. Uh, went to uh, North Dakota schools, graduated from high school in Surus, and uh, eventually ended up at UND and then the UND Law School. Well, you know, okay, and you're here today to talk about your book, and it's a nice, uh, I'd, I'd say it's a good coffee table book as I kind of try to hold it up here. Uh, tell us about, when did you first get the concept to, to write this book? Well, I had the original idea about uh, almost 30 years ago. Uh, my parents had taken me out to the Badlands when I was a little kid, and uh, I guess that made a big impression because those uh, memories never really faded. But then uh, for many years, uh, Harold Schaefer was my father-in-law, and he, uh, of course, was the man who was most responsible for restoring Medora and was uh, extremely enthusiastic about Medora. So spending time with Harold, uh, encouraged me to spend more time in Medora and I became more and more fond of the place until I, I really love Medora. And uh, it struck me that of the hundreds of thousands of people who visit Medora every year, probably most of them leave with very little understanding about Medora's history, which I think is fascinating and uh, I think it's unfortunate if they leave without learning more about it. And I think most of them understand that the Marquis de Mori started the town and uh, some of them, I think mostly they have some idea that Theodore Roosevelt did some ranching there, although perhaps most of them couldn't really tell you where or just exactly when. Uh, some could, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some, particularly if they're north, from North Dakota and maybe if they're a little older, they understand that Harold Schaefer came along in the 1960s and started reviving the place. But there's so much more to tell than that. And so originally the idea I had was that I would write a, a much smaller book with uh, shorter chapters than this. And I thought maybe it could be placed in the hotel rooms. And uh, when people stayed there, they could read through it. They could read a few chapters. If they wanted to buy the book, they could. If they didn't, at least they might uh, read a little bit and learn something about Medora's history. Well, as, as I look through the book and everything, I mean, it looks like the research and the photographs, it had to take a long time to get all that put together. It took me about, uh, I wrote the first chapters about 30 years ago, but then I took about a 25 year break, so that didn't really count. But once I got serious about it, it took about uh, two and a half years. And during that time, the scope of the project grew uh, far beyond what I had imagined uh, 30 years ago when I was thinking of the small book that might be put in the motel room. So yeah, it was a huge amount of work, but I'm very passionate about Medora, very passionate about its history and uh, about the Badlands, and so it was fun. I mean, it's a, a labor of love, I guess, if that's uh, not too trite, but uh, really it was. I, I loved the place, and I had a lot of fun doing the book. Well, now, I understand, of course, your son was involved also. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, my son uh, is a graphic design professional, and so I recruited him to, uh, to do all of the layout work. And to be really honest, you know, of all the people who pick up the book, I suspect a lot of them just kind of flip through and look at the pictures, and the m most common comment I get is, wow, the pictures are great, the layout is terrific. <laughs> and then some of them say, hey, the writing's are <laughs> They like the writing. <laughs> well, you know, with all that said then, how did the, the town of Medora uh, sort of begin? Start? Can you give us a, a little history back to the beginning, maybe? Sure. The uh, the town of Medora owes its beginning to the Marquis de Maurice, but even before that, uh, by the summer of 1883, the buffalo had been uh, decimated, were virtually extinct. And uh, just a short time before that, the Native Americans had essentially been driven off the land and onto the reservations. Uh, you know, everybody knows about Custer's Last Stand in 1876. and. Uh, that was a victory for the Native Americans, but that was very short-lived and the response from the government was very swift and very brutal. And uh, so by 1883, the Indians were gone uh, off most of the land and the buffalo were gone. The land was empty and it was there uh, free for the taking. Now, at that time, this young Frenchman uh, is growing restless with his life and he's reading about uh, people 
making big money in the cattle business out west. There were a lot of foreigners who had invested money out in the, on the western frontier in the cattle business. And he became very intrigued by all of this, started studying it, and he came up with this grand plan, which was his inclination, by the way. I mean, that was his personality. But his big plan was that he would build a meatpacking plant out on the western frontier. He would slaughter cattle there and ship meat in refrigerated, finished beef, in refrigerated cars to the East Coast. So he would eliminate the meatpacking plants like Swift and Armor in, in Chicago. Uh, and so he, he studied uh, the country and he discovered that at the point where the, the uh, Northern Pacific Railroad crosses the Little Missouri River, he had everything he needed. He had natural shelter, he had railroad, he had water, he had ice because of the Little Missouri River, he had fuel in the form of coal, all in unlimited supply, plus grass and uh, shelter for, for cattle, good place to raise cattle. So there he decided to build the town and the meatpacking plant. Okay, so those were his grand plans. But in your book, you talk about the glory years of Medora, sort of an odd combination of himself, T Theodore Roosevelt, but then you talked about uh, uh, cowboys, gunslingers, cattlemen, and uh, such a, a eclectic array of, of folks in, in the Dakota Territory at that time. Right, I think that's what makes Medora so fascinating. It's not one's dimensional. I mean, the Badlands by themselves are a fascinating subject and a fascinating place to visit. Uh, and the town of Medora owed its existence to one man, and that was kind of the fatal flaw, and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later. That was the Marquis de Maurice. But by this remarkable coincidence, just a few months after he showed up, here comes Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, he came out there, ironically, he came out there to kill a buffalo. And he showed up just about three, four months after the last of the buffalo had been, had been wiped out. Well, almost the last. Uh, and that incidentally happened just southwest of Medora, not terribly far out on the, on the plains southwest of Medora there. First the white hunters, uh, killed off about uh, 5,000 head of what was left of the northern herd, and then the government encouraged the Lakota to come up from the Standing Rock Reservation and wiped out the last 10,000, and they were almost gone. Of course, the government's, uh, maybe I'm transgressing a little, but the digressing a little, but we have the Marquis there, then we have Theodore Roosevelt there, uh, we have the Badlands there, and then we have this array of just regular characters, gunfighters, ranchers, miners, and townspeople who wanted to build a town there. Well, and you said you wanted to talk more about the Marquis and, and sort of his grand plan. I mean, and as I looked at it and read, I mean, he was only in the Dakota Territory for four years or so. Yeah, he was. Um, the town built up very, very quickly. I mean, he uh, arrived in uh, April. Uh, he actually arrived in uh, March, but on April he smashed a bottle of French wine over a tent peg and with his uh, valet or private secretary standing next to him, he declared the birth of his new town. That was April 1st, 1883. And he immediately moved in this army of carpenters and bricklayers and other construction workers and started building this town. So it went up very quickly. And then, of course, other people started moving in. And by about 1886, there were probably, he actually had the meatpacking plant up and running in uh, six months, which I find unbelievable, but, mm -hmm. but it's true. By 1886, there were probably about 300 people living in Medora, living and working. The fatal flaw with Medora was that the economy of the entire town depended on the Marquis de Maurice. I mean, there really was no other industry that he either didn't support directly or indirectly. I mean, there were restaurants and there were hotels and there were other things going on, but the town itself was all about him. Of course, the underlying economy was the cattle business. But then, in, uh, if we can jump to the bust all of a sudden, uh, two things happened at the same time. They coincided at the same time. One was that the Marquis meatpacking plant, meatpacking uh, business failed. And the, there were a number of reasons for that. There were many reasons for that, but probably the real fatal flaw was that in order to keep the meatpacking plant going, he had to process beef 12 months out of the year. And he was trying to do that not with grain-fed beef, but with range-fed beef, grass-fed beef. Well, grass-fed beef are really only ready for slaughter very late in the fall or early in the winter. So that was a big, big problem. He also had other problems where he was probably sabotaged by some of the eastern 
uh, meat, uh, meat interest, beef interest. Uh, he had another problem in that people on the East Coast really didn't like the taste of grass-fed beef so much. They were used to grain-fed beef, so he had a lot of problems. But in the fall of 18, November of 1886, uh, they closed the doors on the meat packing plant, ostensibly for the winter, but as a matter of fact, they didn't open again. And then, as if that wasn't enough, the winter of 1886 and 1887 roared into the Badlands, and really across the northern plains, with a fury that had really never been seen before. And the losses of the cattle ranches were incredible. I mean, cattle died by the tens of thousands, by the tens of thousands and many of the ranchers were wiped out. And the ones that weren't wiped out had huge, huge losses, huge setbacks. Mm. Well, now the town itself, how did it get its name? Oh, well, the, <laughs> the Marquis, uh, shortly before arriving out in the Dakota Badlands, had uh, been married. He married uh, Medora von Hoffman, was his fiance or his, his wife. Uh, she was from a wealthy New York family. Uh, the Baron Juan Hoffman, he was a German Baron, but he had immigrated to the U.S. and had a, a bank on Wall Street. He was a very wealthy man by, by any standard, very wealthy. Uh, he also had a castle-like home in, uh, in uh, France, in Cannes, called La Boca. Uh, I think any American would look at it and say, wow, that's a castle. And uh, so he and Medora were married uh, in, in uh, France. Uh, and then after a honeymoon of several months, they came to New York, and that's when he really started pondering getting into the cattle business, and before very long, they were out in Medora. Mm. And uh, one of the first things he did, uh, well, he had many building projects going on at the same time, but one of the first things he did was to start building this home uh, that uh, we now call the Chateau. And of course, it is not a Chateau. A Chateau is much more like a castle, and to his credit, he was an arrogant man, but he did not call his house the Chateau. That was something that the locals cooked up, uh, actually, after he had left. But the name has lived on. But uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a wonderful home uh, for that time and place. It was very grandiose. Uh, perhaps more significantly, it's the only home that the Marquis and the Marquesa built together and decorated together in their own kind of unique style and blend of decorating styles. And I think that even though their life there was brief and it was never their permanent home, they would leave in the winters, go to France, go to New York. Uh, I think they both truly loved that place. Uh, I, I think they really did. Maybe not in the same sense that Theodore Roosevelt did. I mean, they had very different philosophies about this. They kind of tried to make it the, the rustic version of aristocratic living where Theodore Roosevelt just embraced the minimalistic lifestyle and the tougher it was, the better. And the, you know, the, the better he felt about it. Well, let's segue right over into Theodore Roosevelt. You talked a little bit about him. Uh, let's talk about his time in the Badlands. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, Theodore Roosevelt's time in the Badlands is a very important part of American history. Uh, much is made of the fact that he came out there as a weak and sickly young man and then grew strong and powerful. Uh, to tell you the truth, I think a little bit too much is made of that. Uh, when he was much younger, he suffered from asthma, and uh, he certainly worked very hard to build himself up. I think he had accomplished a lot of that by the time he arrived. When he first arrived, the first thing he did was to hire a guy named Joe Ferris. Who, there's a chapter here on Joe Ferris, and he stayed on to become the storekeeper in Medora, the Ferris store. But he hired Joe Ferris to be his guide to take him out uh, buffalo hunting. It was By then, the buffalo were virtually gone. They hunted very hard for two weeks to find a buffalo. And Theodore Roosevelt, well, when they first met, Joe Ferris was very reluctant to take on this greenhorn tenderfoot as a client. He thought he was going to have a babysitting job. And within a few days, Joe was having a hard time keeping up. I mean, Theodore Roosevelt had just spent five days on the train getting out to New York. He spent the first night sleeping maybe four hours or so in this awful hotel called the Pyramid Park Hotel. Then they rode, spent, well, he spent one night sleeping on the dirt floor of the Maltese Cross uh, Ranch, uh, which is where his brother was ranching. Uh, that is, uh, Joe Ferris's brother mm -hmm. was ranching. And then they had a 40-mile ride down to where they were, the Lang Ranch, where they were buffalo hunting. They get up the next morning, and it's pouring down rain. Wow, I mean, what a perfect excuse to take a break. No, nope. Roosevelt would have nothing of it. Off they went in the rain, hunted all day. Got up the next morning, it's raining. Off they went in the rain, no luck. 
tough, tough, tough hunting. Roosevelt's loving it, and Joe Ferris is just about being ground into the ground. So I don't think Roosevelt was quite the weakling that he's portrayed to be. But certainly, he grew uh, stronger, and he also learned some important lessons about democracy out there. You know, he learned that it didn't make much difference whether your name was Roosevelt or if you went to Harvard or the Columbia Law School or that you uh, were in the New York legislature, those cowboys didn't give a lick about that. What they did care about was, you know, whether you held up your end uh, on a long, on uh, riding the big circle, they call it, uh, and, uh, you know, held up uh, your end in a fair fight, whatever it took, that you were square, worked hard, mm -hmm. and uh, Roosevelt learned those lessons. Well, with that said, you, you've got some interesting characters that you write about in the book. Uh, let's talk about two or three of those. We've got a little bit of time here. Uh, Hell Roaring Bill Jones. Ah, what a guy. Hell Roaring Bill Jones came from Ireland. Not much is known about his real early history except that he got into an altercation with his uncle. And when the, the fight was over, the uncle had been battered senseless. And we're not really sure whether the uncle ever woke up or not. But, of course, this guy's name was not really Bill Jones. And so whatever this guy's name was, he changed his name to Bill Jones, lit out for the New World, landed in New York, got a job with the uh, New York Police Department, uh, Fire Department, stayed there for a while, and then decided that maybe he should move farther west where perhaps his proclivity for violence would be less objectionable. So he ended up in Bismarck. There he was on the police department until one day he beat the mayor of Bismarck over the head with his pistol. And uh, Hell Roaring Bill Jones later explained to Theodore Roosevelt that the mayor, he didn't mind it so much, but the chief of police thought maybe Bill should move on. <laughs> so as I said, Bill thought the chief of police was kind of a sniveling little martinet who couldn't see life's big issues. Wasn't worth educating, but in any event, he moved on to Medora where he thought he might find a more progressive mindset. And uh, his first job there was as, as bouncer in the big saloon called Big Mouth Bob's Bug Juice Dispensary. But uh, he moved on from there and was uh, worked on several ranches. And eventually, Hell Roaring Bill Jones became the mayor or the uh, sheriff of Billings County. Hmm. All right, we got to move on. Okay. Elbridge Paddock. Uh, okay, another very interesting guy. Uh, he was a gunfighter. Uh, he killed several people, uh, some of them for not uh, very good reasons. Um, on the other hand, he was, he was well liked. He was, had a way of uh, ingratiating himself with people. And so he actually ended up serving on the school board in early day Medora in the 1880s, if you will. And he too eventually became the uh, sheriff of Billings County. The one really interesting story about Elbridge Paddock is that the uh, soldiers at the little fort or cantonment that were out there didn't have much to do for amusement, so they decided to cook up an argument between uh, uh, Paddock and a guy by the name of, uh, of Livingston. And they would tell one that the other was after him. And they re kept repeating these stories. And uh, one day, one of them, I think, uh, Livingston is riding up to the Pyramid Park Hotel where the soldiers are inside drinking, and they come running outside and say, don't go in there, don't go in there, we don't think we can hold Paddock back, he's gonna get you, and they're raising all kinds of commotion in there. And they would do the same thing when Paddock was approaching. Well, this just escalated the argument and the tension until finally, uh, you know, Paddock and, this was, became a serious thing, and Paddock and Livingston are realizing that if they don't act, they're gonna be looked on as cowards. And so one day, Paddock Livingston loads up his rifle, got on his horse named Cricket, rides towards Paddock's house. Paddock sees him coming and killed him. Hmm. Well, there's more. There's two guns, Billy Roberts. We don't have time to hear. They'll have to read the book, I guess. Uh, when did things go belly up? And then talk about the resurrection with Harold Schaefer. And we're down to just a minute or two here. So. All right. Well, uh, Medora rose very quickly in 1883. And in the winter of 1886, 1887, it virtually died because two things happened. That was that the Marquis' businesses failed and the winter of 1886-1887 devastated the entire economy. So there is, of course, a history there for the next 75 years that I did not cover in my book, having mostly to do with ranching and rodeo. But in the 1960s, Harold Schaefer came along. Uh, what happened was that Russell Reed, who was then the superintendent of the State uh, Historical Society, went to Harold and suggested that he should buy the Rough Rider Hotel 
and perhaps the Ferris store, I'm not exactly sure, but certainly the Rough Riders Hotel, and he said if these properties aren't preserved, they are going to be lost forever. And so Harold went and bought the Rough Rider Hotel. He tried to give the property then to the state, hoping that they would uh, restore it. The legislature said no. I know that was a big disappointment to Harold, and it was probably a big disappointment to Russell Reed, but it might have been the defining moment in the resurrection of Medora, because if the state had restored it, Harold probably would have said, hey, I did my part, I bought the hotel, I gave it to him, and you know, I feel good about that. But as a matter of fact, he then started rebuilding Medora, and then, of course, other, you can't give Harold all of the credit, but he gets all the credit for starting the revival, and since then, many people have pitched in and made Medora what it is today. Ralph, I wish we had more time. If people want more information or would like the book, where can they go? They should go. I have donated the book to the Theodore Roosevelt Medora Foundation, and so they should go to the TRMF website to order the book. All right. Ralph, thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Stay tuned for more. One of North Dakota's state park gems is located near Cavalier in the northeast corner of the state. It's Icelandic State Park, filled with recreational and camping opportunities, as well as a fascinating history of the Icelandic immigrant experience in the Cavalier area. Here's a look at Icelandic State Park. Some people say it's the best kept secret in North Dakota or in this part of the region. Icelandic State Park really has three main segments. One being the ethnic diversity that uh, is told in the interpretive center here. And that goes back from the 1870s to the 1920s. This part of North Dakota was settled before the railroad. So it's very unique in the fact that if you look at a lot of settlements along railroad paths, you'll have large ethnic groups such as Bismarck with the German Russian. This being an Icelandic area, most people came by wagon, horse, walked, ox cart. And so with the Gunluxons and everything, Icelandic State Park was established. The Heritage Center kind of goes up back from a, a seed planted from G.B. Gunluxon, and he talked about the ethnic diversity. And the Northeastern North Dakota Heritage Association built the Pioneer Heritage Center to tell that settlement period from 1870 to 1920. The other side of that with the, the Gunluxons and GB Gunluxons, the big significance of the nature preserve. And so right now we're expanding to include that vision of his, not only telling the ethnic diversity and how the pioneers prospered, but we're also telling the natural world. So people can come here, use their five senses, what they can see at Icelandic State Park and in the region, as well as the natural history, what animals used to be here, what animals are here today, how are animals being reintroduced, and how are they surviving in populations as our population expands. Right beside the Pioneer Heritage Center is our Pioneer Village, and the Gunluxon House and Homestead is original to the site. All the other buildings have been brought in, the Log Cabin, the Cranley School, the Acra Hall, and the Halson Church, and those are key buildings and each play a role in how that Pioneer community was developed. The second part is the Gunluxon Nature Preserve, and that's North Dakota's first nature preserve. The Gunluxon family knew of those very significant biological features and wanted to set that land aside, and there's very significant biological features there. And it's really not touched except for by trails and maintenance so that uh, teachers, professors, students, and public can come and, and see the changing of the landscape. The third part of the park is basically the recreation, and that gets into Lake Rinwick and our campground. We get around 100,000 visitors a year, and anywhere from seven to 12 countries and different nations come here for the beach, for the recreation, for family vacations, for family reunions, and also to uh, study the ethnic diversity. We average around 7,000 camper nights, so if you look at you know, May to September, we're talking roughly 100 campers a night, and sometimes that fluctuates up into the 7700s. The large part of what we have here at Icelandic State Park is responsible because of the Northeastern North Dakota Heritage Association. That association formed the Pioneer Heritage Center in 1986 and when it, that vision came about and in 1989 when it was uh, finished and completed. That was all by donations. That was all by the Northeastern North Dakota Heritage Association coming together, forming that, overseeing the project. The state's involvement was overseeing that and more of the park manager and assistant manager's role of just interacting with that association. And all of the buildings that have been brought in are all a part of that association 
being key members, bringing that in. Each has a person that oversees those buildings and works with myself and the state parks to maintain those. And without that interaction, what you see here today at Icelandic State Park wouldn't be possible. This is your heritage. You can let it be forgotten or you can make it live on to inspire future generations. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded in part by the North Dakota Council on the Arts and by the members of Prairie Public.